Well, today on What's Willie Preaching, I am playing the world's smallest harmonica. This is a harmonica made by Honer, and it actually fits in this tiny little box. So if you need to play a little bit of the blues, well, you could play it on this. Just not very well. I don't recommend it for going out and touring, but it might be fun just to goof around with. And what's neat about it is it comes with a little loop so you can, I don't know if you can see that on the video, but you can hang it on a necklace if you wanted to and have it with you everywhere. So um, I picked this up today at Guitar Center, so that was kind of fun. But today on What's Willie Preaching, I'm going to be talking about Pharisees versus believers, and I'm actually setting up my message for Easter. This is Palm Sunday coming up. Uh, tomorrow, actually, I'm recording this in Palm Sunday of 2014, and um, so you may be watching this at any other time, but it's a good time to be preaching about um, the difference between a Pharisee and a believer. And, you know, the Pharisees were a representation of a type of people that just don't want the gospel to go out. And so they're not just necessarily Pharisees from Jesus' time. Jesus talks about them and lumps them in with every other person who opposed God's work throughout time. Um, so the first point that I'm making today is there have always been Pharisees. And in fact, Jesus called the Pharisees a brood of vipers and said that their fathers persecuted the prophets. In Luke 11, 48 through 51, it says this, But in fact, you stand as witnesses who agree with what your ancestors did. They killed the prophets and you join in their crime by building the monuments. This is what God in his wisdom said about you. I will send prophets and apostles to them, but they will kill some and persecute others. As a result, this generation will be held responsible for the murder of all God's prophets from the creation of the world, from the murder of Abel to the murder of Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, it will certainly be charged against this generation. Now listen, he's talking about from way back to the beginning, and he talks about how Cain was one of their type too. But you know, we've been talking lately about Noah because of the Noah movie that came out. And one of the things that, that Noah had to do was he had to preach to the people about the fact that God was coming to send a flood, but nobody repented in Noah's time. In fact, what they did was just go about doing their own thing. In fact, in Matthew 24, 39, Jesus said this, People didn't realize what was going to happen until the flood came and swept them all away. That is the way it will be when the Son of Man comes. You know, later on, Peter talks about Noah being a preacher of righteousness. Um, but a lot of times they don't just ignore the warning. A lot of times a Pharisee or a Pharisaical type of person will actually mock you for giving them the warning. So I just want to encourage you, if you're being mocked for trying to share your faith with somebody or tell somebody the truth or maybe try to intervene in somebody's life when they're going down the wrong path, don't worry if they're mocking you because you're not alone in that. In fact, they mocked Jesus and they mocked Noah probably and they mocked the prophets. Um, in fact, in Hebrews 11, 7, it says this, It was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. He obeyed God, who warned him about things that had never happened before. Now, that's an act of faith. If something had never happened before, and you step out and say, Okay, I'm going to trust God in it. Well, you're a really strong person of faith. In fact, a lot of times when we feel like God's calling us into something, we go and read a book about it, or we go and ask other people who have done it before. Or we've asked you know, people that we know, well, what do you think about this? Noah didn't have anybody to ask. He just stepped out in faith and said, okay, God told me to do this. I'm going to do it. By his faith, Noah condemned the rest of the world, and he received the righteousness that comes by faith. But you know what? Jesus was mocked, too. You know, they're basically mocking Noah by saying, you know, we're not going to repent and listen to you. They mocked Jesus, too, and in Mark 15, 31, it says, The leading priests and teachers of religious law also mocked Jesus. He saved others, they scoffed, 
but he can't save himself. Now, this was when he was hanging on the cross. It's one thing to mock somebody to their face when they're alive and well and healthy, but when they're beaten and, and hurt and bleeding and broken and you stand around and you mock that person, what kind of an awful reprobate are you? You know, I mean, that just is the lowest of the low, and yet that's how they were. And, and Jesus knew what they were like, you know, which is why he had condemned them earlier. But the, there's a reason why they mock and why they scoff. And the reason is not because they're just necessarily mean people. A lot of times the reason is because they have no belief and they have no capacity for belief and they don't know how to believe and a lot of times they're jealous. They look on at other people and say, hey, you have belief and I want that, but, but I don't have it and I don't know how to get it. And so instead of being humble and seeking God and saying, please help me, you know, like the, the one guy did that got healed and said, I believe, but help my unbelief. They scoff and mock and say, well, if it doesn't happen to us, then it must not be real. You know, if we don't see it, then it must not be true. And that's their attitude. In a section in John 7, entitled in my Bible, Division and Unbelief, this is in verses 40 to 48, it says this, when the crowds heard him say this, some of them declared, Surely this man is the prophet we've been expecting. Others said, He is the Messiah. Still others said, But he can't be. Will the Messiah come from Galilee? You know, they're questioning, they're like, Wait a minute, where does he come from? Does he match what the prophecies say? For the scriptures clearly state that the Messiah will be born of the royal line of David in Bethlehem, the village where King David was born. But they didn't know that though Jesus grew up in Galilee, he was born in Bethlehem. So the crowd was divided about him. Some even wanted him arrested, but no one laid a hand on him. Okay, so now this is in chapter 7. This is way before the, the crucifixion happened. In fact, probably a couple years before, early in Jesus' ministry, they were already trying to decide, should we arrest and kill this guy? Now this is what happened. When the temple guards returned without having arrested Jesus, the leading priests and Pharisees demanded, why didn't you bring him in? We have never heard anyone speak like this, the guards responded. Have you been led astray too? The Pharisees mocked. Here they're mocking again. Is there a single one of us, rulers or Pharisees, who believe in him? And you know, they're basically pointing to themselves and saying, we're the ones that are setting you know, the tone here. We set the bar and you guys have to live up to this, not some itinerant preacher roaming around the countryside. You know, you need to be looking up to us. Do any of us really believe in this guy? Little did they know, this is in John 7, little did they know that Nicodemus, a couple chapters earlier, had gone to Jesus by night and he wanted to know the answer about eternal life. And Jesus talks to him about being born again. You know, but these other guys, they didn't have any belief. They didn't think that he was really the Messiah, and yet if they had been studying their scriptures, they would have known that the time was now for the Messiah to come. But they didn't want the apple cart shook up. They didn't want the boat rock. They didn't want their little gig that they had going really well getting upset because they were people of prominence and power. And so not only did they not have belief, they had a position of authority that they did not want taken away from them. And they didn't want anybody, including the Messiah himself, to come and take their position of authority away. Well, again, this all goes back to how it was from the very beginning. And we see from the story of Noah, which, you know, we've been talking about, all the way up to Jesus and even beyond when they persecuted the apostles, that Pharisees have always been a problem, and the spirit of Phariseeism has always been a problem. But the one thing that really helped you identify a Pharisee back in the early days was not the outerwear that they wore. It wasn't the phylacteries or the Teflon or any of that stuff that they wrapped around themselves. It was the fact that they actively persecuted true believers whether they were new believers from the Jewish community or whether they were believers that were brought in when the, uh, when the, um, the Gentiles started coming into the faith. They would persecute them and, and they didn't want them around. 
Um, it says this in 1 Thessalonians 2, 14 through 16. And then, dear brothers and sisters, you suffered persecution from your own countrymen. All right, that's what we're talking about. In this way, you imitated the believers in God's churches in Judea, who because of their faith in Christ Jesus suffered from their own people, the Jews. So we're talking about Greeks here who were persecuted by other Greeks, just like the early Jews who were Christians were persecuted by other Jews. For some of the Jews killed the prophets, and some even killed the Lord Jesus. Now they have persecuted us too. They fail to please God. Now notice here, Paul's not making a distinction between the Pharisees and the people in Greece um, making persecution. He's saying they're all the same. You know, now they have persecuted us too. It's just the spirit of Antichrist attacking the church is really what it is. They fail to please God and work against all humanity as they try to keep us from preaching the good news of salvation to the Gentiles. By doing this, they continue to pile up their sins, but the anger of God has caught up with them at last. Now, I want to tell you something about a Pharisee. In the old days, it was kind of easy to spot. Here's a guy ratting out a Christian, and the Christian gets dragged off to the lions, you know, or dragged off to be burned at the stake, or to be crucified, or tortured, or whatever. It was pretty easy to spot who the enemy was. But nowadays, the problem is, your average Christian will walk to church with a Bible in one hand and singing a song of, uh, you know, of Jesus, and your Pharisee will walk to church with a Bible in a hand singing a song about Jesus, and they both go by the name Christian nowadays, and they both look kind of the same, and it's hard to spot them. But you know what? You can spot them. Are they persecuting believers? If somebody is trying to do something for God and somebody rises up and gripes and complains all the time about something somebody's trying to do to lead other people to Christ, that person might be a Pharisee. You know, if somebody has got their focus on things of this world so much so that they end up persecuting other people who are really trying to do God's work, that person might be a Pharisee. You know, if somebody has got their eye on all the other things around them rather than their own relationship with God and walking in humble, humbly in fear and trembling, trying to have a good relationship with God and growing in God themselves, and instead they point to everybody else and say, well, you know, you're not as good as me or you're not, you know, as... as uh, refined as I am, or you haven't as much Bible knowledge as I have, that person might be a Pharisee. Now, I'm not saying, you know, we all don't have a little bit of Pharisee in us. Maybe we do. But, you know, we got to put that to death. That's part of that flesh that we got to crucify, you know, and we don't want to be a Pharisee. But, um, so my first advice to you to take this home is don't be a Pharisee. If you feel any of those things welling up in your heart, Get it out of there, you know. Come to God and say, hey, I don't want to be like this. But if you're on the receiving end of a Pharisee and they're attacking you, hey, don't be um, beat down and don't let that get you down because their end is assured. You know, when Noah, we're going back to Noah again, when Noah came uh, to tell everybody, hey, the flood's coming, you better get right with God, and only eight people entered that boat, you know, God wiped all of those people out, all the bad people. And, and you know what we think in the Noah movie makes it out? Well, maybe there were other innocent people. You know, God knows everything. He is omnipotent. That means that he understands and knows every single thought and every single motive of every single person's heart in the whole wide world. And we've talked in another video about eternity and how he, God is in eternity and he's not locked into our timeline, you know? He has an eternal amount of time to spend with each and every person looking into their heart and working with them and, and they can reject God or not. He has all eternity to do that. Well, you know what? They still rejected him, every one of them except for eight people, and he wiped them out in his mercy to start over so that the Messiah could come so that we could be redeemed and have a right relationship with God. Peter says one day the world's not going to be destroyed with water, but it's going to be destroyed by fire. And one day God's going to come and wipe all the evil off of the world. We talked about hell in a vi previous video and how hell is God's attempt 
of containing, you know, it's not his attempt, it's his plan of containing all of the evil that ever existed so that it never gets out again. So I would encourage you, don't be discouraged. Don't let yourself get kicked down. The Pharisees may come, the Pharisees may whine, they may complain, they may cause problems, but one day God has a plan for them too. So keep your chin up, hang in there, and uh, go out and buy yourself a little harmonica and play a little bit of the blues if you get sad. So God bless you.